Best Book Bits podcast brings you Gail Rudolph, executive coach and trainer with 25 years serving in leadership positions across the spectrum of organizations. Gail is a Caldini Method certified trainer. As a Caldini certified trainer, she's credit, uh, accreditation to teach Robert Caldini's six powerful universal principles of persuasion and provide certification to students as an ethical practitioner. She's an executive director of the John Maxwell team and presently serves as the Maxwell President's Advisory Council. Gail is the CEO and founder of Gail Rudolph Collaboration and the author of Power Up, Power Down, How to Reclaim Control and Make Every Situation a Win-Win. Gail, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Now, for more honesty, who don't know who you are, take us back to your early years. Sort of, where did you grow up? Uh, where did you sort of get your education? And what were sort of some of your early jobs back in the day? Well, I grew up in the Midwest in the United States uh, in Southern Illinois. I was the youngest of four children, which uh, has a lot to do with my um, interest in power. Because as the youngest of four children with the oldest brother being 18 years older, it's, it's, there's power there, definitely, or the lack of. Um, and I actually went to school, I did my undergraduate at a Baptist university and my graduate work at a Jewish university. So it's a very uh, interesting combination there. And um, just uh, spent most of my years, 25 years in the corporate realm uh, working in philanthropy, mostly healthcare philanthropy, so working for large organizations. So, um, love to work with people, love to interact, and actually uh, just was really excited when this book came about. It was just my struggle and being able to share with other people. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and we'll jump into the book. I mean, power and the use of power these days, it's uh, such a hot topic uh, and people are thinking and talking more about power than perhaps any time in, you know, in history. Which is a good thing, but but power is a, a massive subject. You've written a book to, to focus as the typical workplace situations with power. Can you give us some examples of what power is and what power is not? Well, you know, power is not dominance. It's not force. It's not coercion. It's not your position. It's not something that is forced upon you or demanded. Um, it is, is empowering other people. It's about remaining in control. It's about making a choice. It's about freedom. It's about creating win-wins for the people around us. Um, power is about our own personal empowerment. Um, it's something that we possess and it's always there with us. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, in the book, some of the notes I got, you talked about power. You're talking about it's an unseen sort of mysterious energy that exists between each of us and how it's how it's used can either increase or decrease our ability to influence and accomplish our goals. So harnessing the power the right way leads to positive interactions with others, getting things done and creates an environment where cooperation and diversity can flow. So you, you took us back to some of the early times, obviously being the youngest of four children and getting into power. Yeah, talk to talk a little bit, sort of some examples that you've had over the years with seeing power at its worst and seeing power at its best as well. You know, being the youngest of four children, um, I learned that there was power dynamics. I mean, we, we have power dynamics that are going on. And with my brother being 18 years senior than I was, and, you know, I had a problem with my voice being heard. What happened when I grew up and got in the workplace, I found that sometimes I had the same problem. I remember when I first started at a community foundation, I was the associate executive director, full-time position, reporting up to an executive director who was a part-time position. What happened was I did the majority of the work and what happened is he took the majority of the credit. And after I had advanced us and reached our three-year goals in a little over a year, um, I decided it was time to go to him and ask for a raise. This is something we had talked about when I was hired, um, once we completed the three-year goals, but because we had uh, advanced them and I had completed them so quickly, of course I thought it was time to ask for a raise and was totally dumbfounded when I sat down with him and I looked at him and I said, you know, this is where we're at. This is what we've done. We've completed these goals. We've, we've reached these benchmarks. I think we need to talk about a raise. And he looked at me and he said, well, you don't need a raise, you get child support, don't you? And as a single mother of two children at the time, I was dumbfounded. What did, what did being a single mom and getting child support have anything to do with the work that I was doing there? And at the time, 
you know, I just kind of pushed back and I continued to, to talk to him about that, but had no luck. And ultimately thought maybe I was getting through to him when a couple of weeks later I saw on the board agenda, you know, staff raises. And um, when it actually came about at the board meeting, it was a raise for him and not a raise for me. And ultimately, because I didn't know how to push through that situation, I was frustrated. I was staying awake at night. I was just, it was, it was consuming me. I ultimately left that position and moved on. Now, with understanding what I know a little bit about power, I would have handled it differently. Maybe not have changed the outcome, maybe not have changed his mind, but I would have held my own personal power and been able to feel better about myself and, and standing in my own power in that situation. Yeah, and I guess you can go back and learn from those situations too and see how you know someone abusing their, their position of power as well will, will make you not in the future abuse your position of power when you get into those uh, circles of influence as well. In the, in the book, you talk a great little story about power and energy. And, and the story comes is you're at a celebrity, you're at an event and a celebrity came into the room and the story of Morgan Freeman and just the power of presence. If you want to relay that story about power and energy. Yeah, actually, uh, I was, I was at an event and it was, uh, just about nine of us in the room and Morgan Freeman walked in and the entire energy in the room changed. You didn't have to understand you know he didn't have to say anything he didn't have to be dominance he just had power when he walked in the room and he's, he's an amazing actor and you know we can see that in a lot of his films but what caught my attention was the energy that happened that he had that he just held his own personal power and I saw that interaction as he came about and we've all had those we don't have to be a celebrity we've all been in a room where somebody walks into the room and we just know that they're there, that they have presence. And that's where power comes in. And we all have it and we can all tap into it at any given point in time. And when you start seeing, you know, that unseen energy of power, it, it ebbs and flows in everything that we have. And we don't see it. It's kind of like the wind, but we feel it and we know it's there and we can see what it impacts. And um, that's why it was so important for me to actually write this book as, as a guidebook for people because we have that power at our disposal at any given point in time. It's we possess it. Yeah, you go on in the book as well, and it's a, it's a good point. There's no, there's no there's no need to seek permission from others or whether we are worthy of having power or influence. We we already have it. You talk about whether we realize or not, each of us has that power and influence, and it's in ever present dynamic in all interactions which we can feel we can we know if someone comes in that that's powerful we can we can feel it we can sense it there's something about it and it's not regulated to those in executive circles as well so we can consciously choose to use it appropriately which i find great and it's it is strange and we all have those celebrity sort of moments where a celebrity comes in we can see people just changes the energy and changes the dynamic as well or if a if a manager comes in or someone in the organization who's high up on the organization chart it changes things and i don't know why that is but it is it is what it is so yeah you you talk about that as well in the book you go through sort of authentic leadership and you talk a little bit about john maxwell and his philosophy of everything rises and everything falls on leadership can you talk sort of about your experience with authentic leadership john maxwell and and a little bit about that well, I think that, that what John really taught me is that we are all our leaders. No matter where we are, we all have influence over everybody. And because of that, um, we don't always see that our impact uh, around the people around us. We think that we need to be in high positions to, in order to, to change things. And that's not the case. Some of the best organizations are by people who wanted to make a change and decided to tap into their influence. It's really being able to manage our verbal, our nonverbal communication in order to make a choice about how we respond in situations that, re that enable us to be leaders. And when we talk about being an authentic leader, I think that so many times, especially me as being a female and, and growing up, um, you know, as I was trying to find my way through the corporate world, uh, you know, I got lots of messages about who I needed to be, how I needed to act, 
And um, it wasn't until I realized that I had to be my authentic self, that I had gifts and talents and who I was and what I was bringing to the table was actually the leadership that was actually needed. And I think that when we think we need to be somebody else, we lose what our actual you know, abilities and talents are and, and they don't get brought to the table in the right way. Yeah, definitely. And, and I appreciate your experience and, and going through all that and writing the book as well. You also talk about leaderships. leadership is influence. It's nothing more, nothing less as well. So, you know, we all know that from a, from a base level as well. Chapter two, you jump into power and choice. So you talk about how we need difficult situations in our lives to keep us sharp, um, actively grow and strengthen our character. Yeah, talk to us a little bit about why we, we sort of need these difficult situations. And even though we feel it at times and, you know, we're stronger and smarter th than we realize. And we need powerful players to help us awaken our power as well. Without that, you know, power power meeting power, we we sort of need that. And we need to put ourselves in situations where we can grow as, as powerful beings as we are. Yeah, we don't grow when we're comfortable. We grow when, when we're being stretched. We grow when we're uncomfortable. We, we grow when we're being challenged. Um, we grow when we're frustrated. And, you know, we, when, when I talk about power, it, it's, it's really two sides of the same coin, right? Uh, it's being able to power up a choice we make to stand in full of presence or to power down, intentionally kind of live, level the playing field. But we have to know what choice to make. Viktor Frankl, who's a Holocaust survivor and psychologist, says, you know, there's a, a space between stimulus and response. It's that space that we're talking about of harnessing that ability to take that space and create in it and decide whether we, how we want to use that space to move whatever it is forward we're wanting to move forward. And that's where we have to have our growth. That's where we have to understand and be stretched and pushed. And by continuously putting ourselves and having a growth mindset, we understand that, you know, just because bad things happen, it doesn't make us a victim that we can choose to actually be a victor um, in any and every situation. Because even if the outcome's not what we want, we can learn lessons and we can sharpen our abilities no matter what's happening around us. Yeah, well said. Yeah, I like how you said victim or victor. I've never heard that before, but uh, yeah, that, that makes sense. And you, yeah, in the book, you talk about we, we have a conscious choice to make. So we can look at people and situations as natural enemies with fear and when fear and power comes into play. Or we can flip the script and realize that, you know, people and situations are, are here to help us grow and strengthen our ability and character. I like how you talk about entering all power Entering power with the correct attitude and the importance of, of our language around power as well. Can you talk about sort of, you know, it's verbal and nonverbal. It's a communication. It's, a, it's you know, it's a language. It's a, it's a dance. Yeah, talk us a little bit about the language around power. Well, what I, what we know and what studies have told us is there's only about 7% of our communication actually happens with the words that we are, are talking and what's really interesting is if you're getting ready to go into a big meeting, you're, you spend all your energy concentrating on what you're going to say and very little of your time on um, what your verbal, nonverbal language, body language says and what your tone of voice says. And one of the things I heard uh, that I thought was great is they said, you want to see how good of a speaker you are, uh, tape yourself and turn off the sound and see what kind of feeling you're getting. From the speaker and it's you know watching yourself speak and i think that that's really key because we express ourselves more non-verbally than we ever do verbally um for example i can i can say you're gonna wear that or i can say you're gonna wear that and it makes it takes a whole different meeting and the only thing i changed was my tone of voice and we don't spend the time looking at what are we doing from a uh, tone of voice level what are we doing with our communications as far as what are we communicating with our body language and that's where the choice comes in in the book you talk, what, so what exactly does sort of power up and, and power down mean for people listening to say you know what does that actually mean you know what we got to think about power as two sides of the same coin and powering up is a choice that we make to kind of step into a fuller presence 
such as doing things like making direct eye contact or taking up more space. I love it when you, when you can take up more space and learn from the animal kingdom because that gives you power sometimes when you're losing power in a situation. Powering down, I had a lot of people say, oh, you never want to power down. I actually think powering down can be even more powerful than powering up at times. It's intentionally changing our stance, right? Or expressing empathy or giving others a chance to interrupt. See, powering down is kind of an intentional way to hold power while making people feel more comfortable. So think of it like a dance, right? When you get pushed at in a conversation, you're going to automatically push back. It's a natural tendency. When we get pushed, we want to push back. When we're in a conversation or in an interaction with people, we're having a dance. It's this energy that's ebbing and flowing back and forth. If we are constantly powering up and that person pushes back with us, we're not going to get anywhere. So knowing when to make the choice to intentionally power down is how we move the conversation and how we, we can create win-win situations. So you, you may power up at one point in time. You would then choose to power down at another point in time. Some of the greatest power down people, one of them that I, I think about a lot is Martin Luther King. He used powering down in an amazing way to move people forward and get them to think differently about things. In, in life as well, if, you, if you're powering up too much, you're going you're gonna to use all your resources and people aren't going to take you seriously. But if you power down quite a bit and let other people you know, blow off steam or you know, act like they're powerful in certain situations, and when the time comes to, to power up, I think that's really going to be felt as well. And you're right, it, it is a choice to, to power up or, or power down, and, and power leads to choice. And choice leads to power as well. And learning to respond, not react, which which, which touched on that. To talk about some of your experiences in inserting pauses and getting comfortable with silence. And you began asking questions on certain projects and some of your um, experience on that. So just talk about some examples that people can sort of insert, how we can insert power, power ups and power downs as well in their day-to-day interactions, whether that be in the corporate world or the personal world as well. You know, one of the things that I learned throughout uh, this whole experience with power and learning how to handle power was that we give our power away a lot of times and just remaining silent. And I'll never forget, I was sitting in a boardroom once and um, one of the board members said, and I was actually a consultant, so I wasn't even on the board. So I was in a position where I couldn't interject very easily. And one of the board members said, you know, um, we're getting ready to do this leadership retreat, but it's just for men. And I watched the whole room react to that um, comment, you know, especially the powerful women that were sitting in the boardroom. I mean, a lot of them were doctors, lawyers, very influential community people. And and the women just kind of sat there and, and I saw other men actually feel uncomfortable with that comment, but nobody said anything. And I sat back and I kind of watched the interaction that was happening. And I thought, somebody, please speak up, do something. And finally, uh, about five minutes later, the the meeting went on for a little bit. And a few minutes later, one of the female board members spoke up and they said, well, that's great that we have that for for the men. What do we have for the women leaders? And I have a conference that they can go to. And, you know, I... I sat there as I watched her simple statement of just saying, okay, let's acknowledge this. Now let's find a solution to, for the other half of the team that happens to be in the room. And I thought about how many times I've sat in meetings and watched people with power um, do something inappropriate or that shouldn't be done and watched people sit there uncomfortable knowing that they should step up and do something, but they remain silent because they didn't know how to stand in their power without creating an argument or, or being a, labeled a troublemaker. And I think that we can get really creative on how we, how we exhibit our power by being able to express ourselves and be creative in how we respond to situations like that. Yeah, and it's a good diffuser as well. So sometimes you need to acknowledge bullshit and, you know, power that's... We're living in such a world of, you know, the government is beating their chest and pretending they're powerful, but 
we're, we're seeing false power for what it is and we're seeing real power for what it is as well. A lot of it comes down to truth and falsehoods. I'm, I'm very quick to to point out falsehoods if someone makes inappropriate comments or if someone says something that's just not true. Um, I like to call it out and be very raw with that as well. And I, I like to get that on the back end as well. If I say something that's inappropriate or not true or coming from a place of ignorance, I like to people to call me out of my own bullshit as well. So I think we're at a stage now where, yeah, having your own power means, you know, being authentic to yourself and saying things that might be uncomfortable, but they might be true. So, um, yeah, great example. Uh, moving on in chapter three, you talk about the power of mindset. And in 2019, you were traveling with John Maxwell to Paraguay. And you talk about a story about it, a group of young musicians who call themselves the Junkyard Orchestra. Can you talk us about that story and the power of mindset on that? You know, I was just amazed. So we got we got to interact with um, some kids, the youngest one being 10 years old. And you need to understand the background a little bit about um, how this all came about. So in Paraguay, you know, kids cannot own a violin um, because, you know, a violin costs more than a house in Paraguay. So when you have children with things like that, they become targets for violence and theft and all kinds of things. So these children um, decided that they wanted to make music. So what they did is they went to the junkyard and they actually took pieces in the junkyard and made instruments out of it. There was this really cute, I'll never forget his smile. He had an amazing smile. And he came up to me and he showed me his violin, which was, you know, taken with a hammer. It was an old pizza pan that was made into the back of the violin. And he turned it over and he said, look here, Gail, see, this is where they burnt the pizza. And it was just amazing because what they had done is they had decided that it wasn't their circumstances. It was the choice that they were making around their circumstances that created their future. And they decided that, yeah, they didn't have the wooden violins that everybody else did, but they could still find a way to do what they were going to do. And it was so powerful to me to look at mindsets and how, how we look at our situations and whether we're looking at them as limiting or an ability to uh, get creative and find an opportunity makes all the difference in the world. I mean, we talk to ourselves in a way we would never talk to anybody else. I mean, we are, we are so critical sometimes of ourselves that we're constantly putting ourselves down, telling, us that, telling ourselves we can't do something or that we don't have the ability to do something. And our mindset is what takes us to new levels. And I really believe our battle starts in our mind. Before we can ever accomplish anything else, we have to harness our thoughts about our being able to actually accomplish. Yeah, well said. And, it, you know, everything starts internally. I wrote my book, Success in 50 Steps, and is the first 22 steps out of 50, it's all internal. Like, there's nothing external. It's all in regards to your your thoughts. It's, it's all internal. Everything starts from the mindset first before it becomes you know, an outward pro an outward projection of what's actually inside. You can see that clearly with, with people as well. It's the, the, the game's a whole mental game. Get the mental right, and then the external game will be okay as well. Even if the external game's not right, like the story, you know, in Paraguay with those kids who were, who were dirt poor, but the internal game was okay. So, you know, it, it's such a different dynamic and especially traveling and seeing different experiences we can see the power of power of thoughts uh one of the great quotes in the book you talk about is if you realized how powerful your thoughts are you would never think a negative thought what do you have to say about that oh i think that is so true you know our thoughts are what set us up for everything that we're doing i mean we can we can we make we have so many choices that start in our in our in our minds right we can get up in the morning and decide how the day's going to go. And our thoughts, um, what we put our attention to is where our focus is. I was thinking about it the other day when I learned to ride a bicycle. Remember when you learned to ride a bicycle? Or, you know, I tried to learn to ski once. I wasn't very good at it, but <laughs> I did try to learn to ski once. And one of the key things that they teach you is where are you looking, right? Because you're going to go where you're looking. And what's really interesting with that is that's where our thoughts start. Our thoughts start where we're looking. 
And, you know, when we get up in the day and we think, okay, how's my day going to be? Our thoughts about that day is how our day is going to go. And, you know, we, we can take our eyes and we can turn them. But if our thoughts are somewhere else, we're going to go in that opposite direction. And that's when we wobble. So when you learn, when you learn to ride a bicycle, you know, if our thoughts are thinking about going left, and even if we're looking right, but we're, we're leaning towards left, we're going to wobble and maybe fall over on that bike. And I think life has a, lo has a lot of the same lessons, is that we need to align how we're thinking about what we're approaching, you know, and once we can align that and grasp that then we can conquer anything yeah absolutely and you talk about in the book the the power begins in us and you know you've worked as an executive coach and trainer and, and you've seen the impacts of self-limiting beliefs on on all of us and our in, sort of our internal broken record incessantly parrots you know i can't can you talk about some of the things you've experienced with self-limiting beliefs and how we can sort of overcome them and, and tackle for those people out there who who struggle with you know i can't you know, I was the youngest of, like I said, of four children, my oldest being 18 years older than I was, all of them being much older. They were all adults when I, you know, came on the scene. So I'm the five-year-old child. So I was always told, you can't, you're not old enough. You don't know how you, you can't do that. And it, I adopted that. And I went through life thinking that I had limitations, that I couldn't do things. And I struggled with that. And sometimes even those, those old voices, right? I adopted those opinions of other people and those old voices still to this day will come play in. And when we can realize that we're hearing those, it's not the fact that we don't hear them, it's the fact of what do we do with them once that they arise. I think that we always get negative thoughts. We, they always come up, we always get self-limiting beliefs. But what do we do with them? Do we counteract them? Do we replace the I can't with I can? Do we replace the I'm not powerful with today's the day I take back my power? When we replace those, it, it, that's when the change can start to happen. And I think that we sometimes beat ourselves up. We think, oh, I shouldn't be thinking those negative thoughts. But it's just as simple as saying, you know what? Yeah, I had a negative thought, but you know what? I'm going to replace it because I'm going to choose to believe this. This is the one I'm going to adopt. Yeah, and it's calling it calling out your old sort of programs and scripts and loops as well. Like we've all heard it before that we become what we believe about ourselves. So we become what we believe about ourselves. And, you know, if we believe the wrong thing, well, we're not going to really live to our full potential so we also need other people you know we can't see the end of our nose so we need other people to tell us things that are good about us give us hope give us inspiration mentoring all that all that great stuff as well there's so many great teachers out there that can help us overcome our bullshit and uh, our negative scripts and loops as well i love one of the quotes in the book you talk with Brene, about Brene brown only when we are brave enough to explore our darkness will we discover the infinite power of our light as well Talk about how this relates to power and how that we sometimes have to, you know, look at our negative and dark side for us to find our, our true power. Well, I think that we have many times we have a um, negative connotation when it comes to power. We think that power is something negative because we've seen it in our government. We've seen it. Uh, people take advantage of their position, which is not power. You know, power is the capacity to influence a situation or a person. It's not, it's not dominance or control. And when we don't look at our own faults, when we don't look at our own belief system, I've heard, I've heard belief system, um, you know, are basically called BS, right? Our belief system stands for our own BS. But when we look at where our faults lie and, and when we look at our dark side, what we're bad at, then when we become honest with ourselves, we can actually grow from that. And that's when it enables us to feel like we have, we can step into power. Um, it's kind of like money, right? Some people have a really negative connotation of money. Power is the same way. We have a negative connotation about power, but we have power. We all have power. It's not something that, that we don't or, or, or need to ask for or somebody needs to give us. We have our own personal power, our own empowerment. And it's those negative thoughts and that those those dark beliefs and our past uh, experiences sometimes that have created 
um, a side of it that that we have to explore in it in order to be able to truly step into our pla- our our real power and become truly empowered. Yeah, definitely. We've got the power to choose, the the power to do and not do, the power to speak or the power to be silent, the power to give or the power to take. You know, there's so like there's so so much power at our fingertips that we don't even explore or have the opportunity to use or or consciously think we we go around on these programs as i said um one of the other quotes i like in the book you talk about is we wouldn't talk to a friend the way we talk to ourselves and you know that that's crazy the amount of sort of self-defeating talk that we talk to ourselves we would never would never say that to a friend as well you also go through about personal empowerment requires us to begin to change these repetitive and self-defeating thoughts and words and and shift our mindset into a more encouraging and loving and kind and some of the examples you give how to shift to negative phrases into self-affirming ones is instead of saying i can't you say i can instead of saying i don't believe you say i know i'm bad at equals i will i'm afraid equals i'm confident i'm it's impossible equals anything is possible and the last you know and i don't have any power equals today is the day i choose to take my power back do you want to expand on on any of those um you know i think the last one i think you know today is the day we choose to to grasp our power um it's it's so easy to get caught up in those negative phrases and i've even taken times where i i say the negative phrases out loud like dumbbells three or four times right when i'm saying i i can't when i find myself saying i can't i'll actually start saying out loud i can i can i can and When we harness those negative self-talks, when we can harness our mindset, then we can step into our power and it helps us to be able to be confident in who we are and be our authentic authentic self. Perfect. And I like in the book as well, you talk about sort of one of the, one of the worst ways or examples of, of garbage programming and our beliefs is that uh, we can change others and we spend too much time, too much of our precious time and energy trying to fix other people. Can you talk about why this is, this is why it's not the case? You know, very powerful, successful people do not spend their time trying to change other people's minds. They just don't do it. Um, they, they take the people that, uh, are with them or that understand them and they move forward with it. And I think that we get caught so many times spending time and energy thinking that we have to have everybody that likes us or that everybody has to agree with us or that we have to change their mind. And we don't have to do that when we can feel solid in our power and who we are. It doesn't matter that that the other person doesn't agree with us. We can accept that about them, that they are different, that they have uh, different opinions, different ideas, and that that's in itself what makes the world go around. It's that diversity and that difference of thought. And when we're truly wanting to be empowered and to know how to handle power, we have to be able to allow other people to have their own power also. Oh, yeah, and it's, it's definitely a dance to let people be powerful while you can power down and let other people power up as well. Moving on in, in Chapter 4, you talk about power and influence and your experience coming a Cialdini Method Certified Trainer and going through sort of, you know, hundreds of hours of study time, oral and written exams, one-on-one coaching, rigorous audited presentations of your material. And you talk about how, you know, what leads people to say yes and because then you talk about your experiences and any stories and, and how that sort of unfolded with your understanding of power and influence with Robert Cialdini. Yeah, you know, um, it was a it was a grueling process. There's only 13 of us in the world. I'm the only female in the United States. So that tells you a little bit about how the process goes. Um, yeah, he uh, we studied under him for uh, quite a while. There were three in my group, uh, my Uh, kind of cohort that started the process. I was the only one that actually managed to make it through the whole program and was certified. And um, what I, what he did was just amazing. So he decided he was going to go undercover. He's a research psychologist by trade and he works at Arizona State University. And he decided he was going to go undercover to see what caused people to say yes. So he changed his clothes, he changed his demeanor, and he went undercover at places like used car sales training, you know, um, marketing agencies, um, 
ad agencies. He even actually went undercover at the cult to see what, what they did to get people to come in and to say yes. He took that information that he learned in real life and then he took it back to the laboratory and he saw what he could recreate and what crossed over time and energy about what, what leads people to say yes. And he came up with six principles. Um, the first one being reciprocity, you know, that we, and our whole society is built on reciprocity, that we have this ability to want to give back to people who have given to us first. Um, the next one is liking. We prefer to do business with people we know, like, and trust, right? And um, then we talk about consensus. Um, you know, when we're in a, a town and we need to find a restaurant, we go on Yelp. Yelp is consensus. What are other people doing in the same situation um, as we are? What are the choices they're making? We look to see what others are doing. Um, then we have authority. We look to people with authority. It's not people in authority, but people that are authority about things. So for example, we look to CPAs or lawyers or doctors um, when, when we want to, to understand things. So we look to people who are in authority. Consistency is a, is a really interesting one. We have an internal need to remain consistent. So we, fear, we experience interpersonal pressure to be consistent with things that we've done or said or taken a stand on before. And um, consistency is, you know, very, very, very powerful because it's internal. And the last one is scarcity. And if you don't believe scarcity works, you can look at Black Friday, right? And how everybody rushes to the sales because there is, you know, a, a certain amount of items for a certain amount of time. What's really interesting is I'm noticing that the Black Friday is missing uh, the concept of scarcity because they started with it and it worked really well for them. But now the scarcity is, is being spanned out over the month, right? You can get the, any products. Uh, there's there's you know not a limited number. So um, scarcity is an emotional thing. We we see things that are they're they're more desirable when there's less of them. Yeah, yeah, well said. Thank you for expanding on that. And yeah, yeah definitely right. In chapter five, you, you go on and talk about sort of powerful boundaries. Can you talk about sort of why boundaries and, and power um, yeah, correlate and, and relate to each other? You know, I call boundaries our secret sauce to, to power. Um, and the reason is that so many times we confuse our lack of boundaries with our ability to have power. And, um, you know, I hear and I coach a lot of people who say, you know, they just they just don't understand. I keep telling them I don't want to work in the evening or, you know, not to call me. I have family things. And when I dig a little deeper, I find out, OK, well, you're taking the phone calls at night. You know, you're not setting your own limits. And without us setting our limits and being able to know where kind of we stop and other people start. Um, we can't, we can't, uh, we can't talk about power if we can't hold our boundaries. So I like to think of boundaries kind of as a property line. So my dad was meticulous about keeping our yard. He would go out and he'd walk our yard, he'd mow it, he'd pick up little pebbles because back in those days they didn't have the catchers right and a, a little rock in our yard could, could fly out and hurt somebody or break a window. And he would groom our yard right up to our property line. And our neighbor would do the same. They'd groom their yard right up to the property line. And anybody that was walking by wouldn't know where our property line ended and there started. But we did. And what's really interesting is when we think about boundaries, it's really parameters we put around our time, our energy, and our money. And if we don't have a set place of how we're going to spend our time, our energy, and our money, how can we expect other people to know where we stop and there to begin? 
Yeah, and I'd like to add another one where the only thing we can spend is our time, energy, money, but then emotion as well. So, you know, we've got emotional boundaries on where we can go to and where we go where we won't go to as well. But yeah, that's an interesting story about, you know, boundaries and power and yeah, I can I I've got some personal experience with with that as well. I'm I'm a bit like your dad too. In chapter 17, you you talk about power personalities as well. I'll go through some of them and if you want to explore some of your top ones, you talk about the toxic uh, pollinator, the snaker, the insulter offloader, the info hoarder, the negatron, and the swoop and poop. <laughs> um, tell me, what's what's your favorite one and, and what's it about, the power personalities? Oh, well, you know, I have to say probably my, my favorite one is the uh, swoop and poop just because of the neat name, right? We, we One thing we need to realize is when we're talking about these kind of power personalities, we've all been probably each one of these at some point in time. Um, it's not one person that we want to put a label on. In fact, putting label on people uh, doesn't create inclusion or help when it comes to being diverse or creating a, an, a good working environment. But, but the swoop and poop is, and, and because I was a boss, uh, I can say that, that I'm guilty of this, but um, I'm going to give the example of a board member that we had. And the board member would come in and we would never see him uh, really between the board meetings very often. But when he did come in, he would create all this havoc. He'd be asking questions. He'd be doing all kinds of things. He'd, he'd send the staff in a turmoil. And then he, so he'd swoop in, he'd kind of dump all this stuff and then he'd disappear just as fast. And I think that sometimes as a boss, I would come in and I'd create all this havoc and then I'd disappear just as fast. And when we have people in our lives that come in and they just, you know, kind of, swoop in and they poop on us and they leave that we we need to realize that as a as a power personality and deal with it appropriately yeah definitely we've all had those experiences of um i like how you the, the names of the personalities but yet we everyone's got their own stories of bosses and people that they can they can label for acting out those power personalities and it's quite interesting the machinations that people do and and it's funny that they don't know what they do and how they're actually talked about behind their back as well but i guess that's that that gives you the information to change how you don't want to act and how you how you don't want to be as well moving on before we sort of wrap up there's, there's so much in this book so for my audience out there i would definitely recommend go out and buy this book because uh, power is everywhere and understanding what power is but one of the last things i want to touch on is you talk about powerful language can you talk about sort of some of the powerful language and things like, you know, listening, even connecting, priming, power and negotiation and things like that. So what is some powerful language uh, that we can use? You know, um, we can use a lot of powerful language. And I always say that, that there's a lot of power that's missed in uh, what we're doing before we actually meet with people. So one of the key things that I think that we can use powerful language is in our scheduling. If you open anybody's given schedule, it's one of the first things I do when I go in and I consult with a team that's having issues and I look at their schedule and they'll say one on one meeting. Right. And I'm like, well, let's change some of these meeting names. You know, let's start calling them, you know, collaboration meetings, brainstorming meetings. Right. Um, because what we can do with our language is actually when we say a word people actually follow and it becomes, they'll become it. For example, if I pick up the phone with a person and I am saying, hello, friend, hello, friend, they're going to think of themselves as my friend very quickly. If I am telling somebody how cooperative they are, or how easy they are to work with, um, they are ultimately what happens in us as human beings is we become cooperative and easy to work with. We tend to fit into the words that we're kind of hearing from us. And as long as they're positive words, that's great. But if we're not thinking about the words that we're using, um, the other thing that I talk about a lot is women, especially I did a white paper a couple of years ago that talk about women in the workforce tend to be viewed as either competent or friendly and but very rarely both so changing our words we use depending on how you're viewed right if you need to be more friendly then you use things like uh, you know hello friend or i'm excited 
um, collaboration. If you want to be more competent, you want to talk about things like productive um, and, uh, you know, uh, brainstorming and some things like that to strategy, words that actually go along with what you're trying to convey. Yeah, that's awesome. One of the notes I got from that, I liked how you said, we fit, into, we fit into where we are feeling as well. So it's very important that, and one of the things you said earlier, which was we strive so much for consistency in, in what we've done in the past as well. So I think these are all very interesting as well. I mean, there's so much more to unpack in the book, but I'll, I'll sort of leave it to the audience to go out there and, and, and buy the book. I don't want to give up all the, the secrets as well, but where can um, where can people buy the book and sort of connect with yourself, Gail, as well? Uh, you can buy the book on Amazon.com, uh, Barnes & Noble, anywhere that sells books. Um, you can uh, get a hold of me or, or uh, become involved with us if you go to gailrudolph.com backslash join. You can actually join our, um, the GRC community. Uh, we give you daily thoughts. You can get uh, some insights. You'll get uh, different things that we have that as we come out with new teachings as we new, and new things, we share them with you. Yeah, awesome. Gail, thank you for being a, a great guest on the Best Book Bits podcast. And to my audience out there, yeah, go follow Gail. Buy this book. We all need to find our own power and power up and power down. So yeah, thank you for the insights uh, on this great book. And uh, will there be another book coming out in the future? Do you think maybe? I am not sure. This one just came out. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see, but probably. <laughs> All right, Gail, thank you very much for being a guest and uh, we'll speak to you soon. Okay. Thank you.